so this is going to be a bonus video in regards to adding features to the memory game. Now, I, now in one of the previous videos, the tutorial talks about how to set up a memory game, and I had talked briefly about how we can go into the code and edit it so that we can, instead of having hard-coded Instead of having a hard-coded set of eight cards, we can basically change it on the fly, program it however we want, so that we can have an arbitrary number of cards in any set, in any arrangement of cards in a grid that we want. So, this is going to be a bonus video about that, and all of the edits that we're going to make to the code are going to be for the scene controller script. No other modifications required other than, well, adding more sprites for new card types. Okay, so let's look at the base project as it was. I play the game. The scene controller is going to randomize an array of eight numbers. Those numbers were initially in an array. 00112233 those are all scrambled by a scrambling algorithm I should say that algorithm is Knut's uh, shuffling algorithm I can now play the game click click no no okay not the, none of them match yet okay there we are uh, this was a crescent I believe yes it was um, diamond no okay that was a heart and there we go four points And I can click the start button to start a new game. Click, click, no, no match. Um, square. Um, oh wait, these were diamonds. Heart. Uh, that was a heart. Okay. Um, I'm gonna deduce that this is the crescent. No, but I know that was the square. There we go. Start again. Doop, doop. No. Uh, yep. Yeah, here we are. Square. Was this a square? Yes, it was. Uh, crescent. Uh, rhombus. No. Diamond. Diamond. Here we go. Matched. Okay, so, as it is, this game is perfect if all you ever want to play is um, a matching game with only 8 cards. But what about larger numbers of cards? What about new card types? Can we do that? And the answer is yes. Alright, so I'm going to close, I'm going to minimize that project, and I'm going to show you the modified project that adds all of those features. And once again, all of these additions are to the scene controller. Alright, so here are those additions, and I'm going to explain everything step by step. Alright, addition number one. These four fields were initially public const int or public const float. Change those so that you don't have the const keyword anymore. It's just public int or public float. That way, when we go into the inspector, we can edit those fields directly in the inspector. That way, if you want a new scene that has the same script, but a different number of cards, we can. That way we can use the same script over and over and over again without having, without having to make new scripts that does the same thing, but with different values. I do have default values set to 2, 4, 2, and 2.5 because that was the original values called for in the original project, but just because those are the default values doesn't mean I have to use them. See how I have 2, 5, 2, and 2.5? I changed one of the values in the inspector. Okay, so that's change number one. Change number, two, change number two is this. We're going to add a private, we're going to add a private field that is for an array of numbers. So here how here is how this works. We originally had hard coded this following array in the start method where we had cards with IDs 00112233. We are going to get rid of that and we're gonna replace it. But before I get to this, I need to explain what we're going to replace it with. What we're going to do is instead of entering uh, 00112233 and then hard coding that, we're going to enter in the inspector 
zero, one, two, three, and then we're gonna pass that array into a method that will create a new array with the values zero, zero, one, one, two, two, three, three. All right, so those are all the changes that we're making to all the fields. All the other changes are going to be in the start method, and one new method is also going to be added. Let's start with the start method, however. We are going to remove this line of code where the numbers were hard-coded. We are replacing that entirely. Instead, we're going to define it as the output of this produce deck method in which we are passing this card IDs for deck array, which is defined all the way up here. So card IDs for deck was defined as 0, 1, 2, 3, though we can change that to whatever we want. We can then pass that into a method that I've called produce deck. What does that do? Well, it's all the way down here. So we are also going to add a private method that produces a deck of cards. So given an array of card IDs 0, 1, 2, 3, that's the input. The output's going to be 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. And so, oh, here is the code for that new method. I am producing a array that is twice the size of the original. And for every entry in the original array, I'm going to add it to the new array twice. So the code for that is as follows. Uh, we're going to create a new array whose length is twice that is the original. We are going to do a for loop that looks like this. Uh, for int i equals 0, i is less than new array dot length. And not i plus plus, but rather i plus equals 2. Because we are adding two values at a time, so we need to, so we need to hop, we need to increment in our for loop two times. Or as I, I should say, we increment by two. So in the for loop, we are going up by two elements in the array each time. But every time we do a for loop iteration, we are adding two values. Those values are going to be in new array i and new array i plus one. And those values are going to be numbers but i over 2 for the index. The overall effect of all of this is for every element in the old array, it's going to be entered twice in the new array. And then we return that, and now we have the same array as we did before all of our modifications. Okay, so that's the new numbers array. Instead of having it hard-coded like this, we're gonna produce a deck, and then we're gonna use these IDs to produce our new deck. Before we continue on and enter the doubly nested for loop, we need to add a counter. So this counter is going to count how many cards we have placed so far. And this is for one key feature. If we have a grid of cards and the number of cards is an odd number, then that is going to produce an, un an impossible game. There's, due to the pigeonhole principle, and you can look this up, it's called the pigeonhole principle, we're going to end up with one card that cannot be matched with anything else. So to keep that from happening, I'm adding extra code. I'm adding a counter so that if we have, for example, a 3x5 grid which supports 15 cards, but we can only have it, but we have it set up so that we have 12 cards. Then we'll just fill out using then we'll just fill out the grid using the 12 cards, skip the extra three, and then we are basically gonna play with a 3x4 grid rather than the whole 3x5 grid. It becomes a lot more interesting if you have 14 cards because uh, 2 times 7, those are the only factors that produce 14. And basically, it means if you want to have a grid of 14 cards, your only options are 2x4, no, 2x7, or 7x2. We can go with a more compact grid, say 3x5, but we're going to have a 15th card what this code does is it skips the 15th card. 
because you only have 14 cards. And how that happens is within the for loop itself. We can only add a card if the number of cards we've added is less than the number of IDs in this array. So if we have a grid that can support a maximum of 15 cards, which would produce an impossible game, and we said, no, 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 we actually have 14 cards. If we exceed the cards added, or if we meet or exceed the number of cards added, we're going to skip that for loop iteration that would produce that 15th card. See what I mean? So maybe if I drew, drew this out. So suppose we had a card deck that had 14 cards in it, but our grid is 15 cards. So the algorithm for placing down cards on the grid is as follows. It goes... I thought for a while it would go row by row, cell by cell. But no, it's column by column. So the algorithm for placing down cards works like this. And we're going to use our example of the 3x5 grid with 14 cards. We place a card here, and then here, here, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then we stop here because if we add a 15th card, we would have an impossible game. But the produce deck method that I had talked about will only ever produce an array that has an even number of elements in it. So you can never have 15 cards because it's not coded, because it's impossible to get that situation. And if we, even if we did, it would be an impossible game. But this code here is set up so that if we have fewer cards than the grid can support, then the grid's going to support them anyway, and it's going to skip any cards that would exceed the number of cards in our deck. So we have a grid with 15 cells, but we only have 14 cards, no problem. Here's another change. I also swapped out this index value for the cards added value. So replace the value of index with the value of cards added. So instead of saying int index equals j times grid columns plus i, for the sake of making sure this all works, I just said int index equals cards added. And this cards added is that counter from up here. All that does is keep track of how many cards we've added so far. It also makes for a convenient index because we are making sure that cards added never exceeds the number of cards that are in our deck. At the same time, we're using it as an indexer. We're using it as an index for our uh, array of cards that we had produced all the way up here. So indices 1 through 14 for our example of 14 cards on a 3x5 grid. So, yeah. Towards the end, of this whole block of code, I'm going to add a debug line for debugging purposes. I'm going to say placing card, cards added, uh, with id, id at position i minus j from the top left card. Because uh, that one card that we have on the grid is going to be our starting point, And that card is going to be at the top left. That's going to be the top left corner of our grid. So what we do is... As, I sh as I've drawn it previously, we go column by column, down, next column, down, next column, down, next column, down, and then we just fill in each column as we go. At the end, we need to increment our cards added value by 1. So, cards added plus plus. <laughs> and that's all there is to it. Alright. So, let's see this game in action. What I'm going to do is, first
first I'm gonna restore this to its set of default values because let's start there to make sure it works. So I'm gonna set up the scene controller so it only has four cards and on a grid that is two by four. Save that. Oh yeah, and we can also move the card front as needed. We can change the spacing between cards as needed because by opening up these values so that they're editable, editable in the inspector, it makes the code far more flexible. It makes the code far more reusable. All right, so this is the base code with only the two by four arrangement of cards using only four card types. Let's play this game. Uh, nope. Uh, wait, this I know this was a diamond. So there we go. Uh, crescent. Uh, those matched. Uh, no. Okay, that was a heart, and there we go. Let's start a new game. Uh, yep, yep, no. Oh, oh wait, those match. Um, let's match those. No. Uh, maybe this one. Okay, that was a heart. Maybe. Okay. I know this was a... No, it was the other one. There it is. And there we go. Yeah, I had also already shown you how to make a new card using a simple image editing program called Paint.net, and... You may have recalled that I actually add, added these to the project itself. So, let's add them to the project. I'm going to go to the scene controller, and in this images array, I'm going to add two new elements, and I'm going to... Well, by default, they're going to be the square symbol, because that was the previously the last element in the array. I'm going to make element 4 the star, and element 5 the triangle. And we can add new... We can add even more shapes if we need to. Okay, so now I'm going to make this a 2 by 5 grid. <clears throat> Actually, no, that's going to be a problem. Let's make this a 3 by 5 grid. So this is going to demonstrate a... This is going to demonstrate a grid with... A grid that can hold up to 15 cards, but we only need to fill in 12 of those possible slots. Okay. If I play this right now, we, I should see 12 cards in a grid. Okay, so something went wrong here. I believe that's because I did not fill in the array itself. So, the deck only has... Four IDs, that means it's going to have eight cards. And it means... I forgot a few entries. So, I'm going to add two new entries and make these values uh, four and five. And those elements correspond to elements four and five in our images. Those are going to be uh, the crescent, the diamond, the heart, the square, the star, and the triangle. Because the star and the triangle are our new shapes. So now, this array has six entries, which means our deck is going to have 12 entries. Our grid supports up to 15 cards, but we don't have 15 cards. We only have 12. Let's see what it looks like. Okay. Uh, apart from a few spacing issues, it seems to have worked. Oh yeah, and look at my debug console. It has... Placing card 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, at position 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, minus 2, 1, minus 0, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 2, 2, minus 0, 2, minus 1, and so on and so forth. The debug console doesn't really say it right because, um, negative 0? Is that even a thing? Well, in some contexts, it actually is. Don't really don't really see negative zero all that much. It's basically the same as zero. Okay, so let's play this game. It is the same game as before, except I have new card types. Two of them. So let's play. Uh, diamond and crescent. No. Oh, there we go. Uh, triangle and... Okay. No? Okay, that's a heart. Uh, star. 
triangle. Okay, I know these were triangles. Uh, heart. Maybe that was a heart. No. Okay, these were the hearts. Uh, star. Was this a star? Yes, it was. Uh, square. No. I know this was uh, diamond and diamond and square and square. Yes, it worked. Okay, so now we have this array of card IDs. Let's have some fun. What if I did this? Now there are seven card IDs, but only six. But only six card types. Is this legal? Yes, it is, because, well, as long as I am not using any IDs outside of the... As long as I'm not using any IDs that don't correspond to any, any elements out here, so as long as my IDs are not out of range, I can do stuff like this. So, what I have done is elements 5 and 6 are the same card ID, which means... By the pigeonhole principle, again, there are going to be two pairs of the same card. Is that legal? We're going to say yes. So, with that card deck, our grid now looks like this. There are 14 cards arranged in a grid that can support a maximum of 15 cards. But we don't have a problem of having a 15th card because the code knows to skip having cards that exceed the 14th card. So let's play with this grid. Okay, uh, triangle and a square. No, uh, triangle. Okay, that was the triangle. Square, that was a square. Uh, crescent, crescent, that's a, not a crescent. Okay, star, star. Okay, those matched by chance. Triangle. I think that was a triangle. No. Uh, okay. These were the triangles. And I would say that uh, elements 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5 correspond to the crescent, diamond, heart, square, and then the star, and the triangle. In my deck, I said we're going to have one pair of crescents, one pair of diamonds, one pair of hearts, one pair of squares, one pair of stars, and two pairs of triangles. So that's why the triangle appears two times. I should say four times. There are two pairs of triangles. The pair, the triangle pair occurs twice, which means there are four triangles. And by the pigeonhole principle, we would have to duplicate one of these IDs. Okay, so let's continue playing this game. Uh, crescent, crescent, okay. Uh, diamond, heart, uh, okay. These are the diamonds, and so by process of elimination, these two should be the hearts. It works! Okay. So let's play with this once more, and one other thing we can do is change the spacing between each card. Now that these values can be edited in the inspector, I can just change this to be like 2.2, and maybe 1.7. Let's try that out. First I'm going to try out the new spacing, see if it works. If you don't like it, then we can just move things out of the way. Okay, so maybe the... Maybe a value of 2 was already okay, but if I do that, I'm probably going to have to just move. Oh, be careful with moving these cards. You don't... What you want to do has, is to move both the front and the back. Really, you should just move the parent, and everything else that that shit will move along with it. So, does this look good? No, but we can adjust it if we need to, so... Point one, and let's try that again. Maybe it should be the X that has to be adjusted also. Uh, let's try that again, again. Uh, okay, now they're a little bit scrunched up. Maybe, as, maybe something like that was better. So some trial and error to make sh to get a grid that looks good. Okay, we're gonna call that good. And now I'm gonna do something else else. So our scene controller knows 
up to six card types. It knows six card types. Can we have can we have an array for our card I can we have an array of card IDs here that has fewer unique IDs? For example, what if I had zero, zero, one, one, two, two, three? Can I do that? The answer is yes. So what this means is there are going to be two pairs of the crescent, two pairs of the diamond, two pairs of the heart, and one pair of the square, which makes the game a little bit easier because there are fewer unique pairs, which means there's a lot of uh, play. What I mean is um, when we play, just as gonna be greater opportunity to match a card with its corresponding pair. So these two form a pair, but if I can find if I can find another crescent. Okay, so these two had all so this and this had already formed a pair, but this and this formed their own pair. It's just that also if we had revealed this and this, they could have formed a pair as well. Let's keep going. Uh, diamond, heart, 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 uh, another heart, and another heart, and diamond, diamond. Okay, it works. So, really it doesn't matter what... Okay, what I'm saying is this. Some of the cards, there are four of them. So it doesn't matter what pairs with what, as long as there's a same. If you've ever played a memory game like this using, say, a deck of cards, you know that there are like four of each number value. So like four aces, four twos, four threes, four fours, so on and so forth. And then you got the four jokers, no, four jacks, four queens, four kings. And then the ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. There are four variants of that. So, or even more elaborate modification, we could we could match by one of two different criteria. If you wanted to use like an actual deck of cards, we can match by. Well, no, we can't actually match by suit because um, there are thirteen. Uh, there are 13 cards per suit, and like 4 cards per value. So that wouldn't work. So I take that back. Okay. We have, what I'm saying is we have duplicate cards, but that's okay. As long as they match. So this could match with this, or this, or this. This could match with this, or this. This could match with this. Doesn't matter. Now, as long as we know that these, these, arrangement of, these arrangements of cards work, and we don't do anything weird like this where we say we have... Okay, so I'm going to make this game unfair. <laughs> and I'm going to do that by... Oops, all diamonds. But you won't know whether they match because there are hidden values associated with them that make them not match, even though they look like they should. So... I have now made this game unfair. Watch. Diamond, diamond, they don't match! <laughs> okay, those match. Okay, those did not match. They're all the same sprite, but they don't match by appearance. They match by ID. So I've made this game unfair. Let's see how long it takes me to beat this. No. No. Okay, those match. You're better off using brute force for this, and there we go. Finally. <laughs> Unfair game of memory. So. 
let's put it back as it was before. So now we have six unique uh, card types, but we have fewer unique IDs in our deck. And as I said, that's okay, because the scene controller can support that. <coughs> I'm just gonna set it back to the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 setup. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5. So if you play that now, we're gonna see all six card types. We're gonna see all six card types. Instead of that the six card type, there's gonna be two pairs of that. Star, star, no, uh, square, heart, no. What's that? No, this was the heart. Okay, square, no, 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 uh, eh. square, square, no. Triangle, triangle, uh, triangle, another triangle. Crescent, is this a crescent? No. Okay, that's a star, I mean, that's a star, uh, was that the diamond? Yes, it was. There we go. Alright, so, <laughs> hopefully this will help you out with figuring out how to modify the code so that you can have arbitrary matching games like this. So, if we want different matching games, we will need to have different scenes for different difficulties. So we did also see a little bit of how we can call new scenes. So. Maybe what you could do is this. We can have a main menu, and we can just choose a different difficulty level based on we, how many card types there are and how many unique card types there are. And then clicking the restart button up here would instead take us to the main menu. The main menu would ha have, as I said, different links to different levels, those would be their own scenes. But in each scene, all I gotta do is reuse all the same code, all the same assets, all the same everything. The only thing different is how we set up this array of IDs. As long as the IDs in here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, match up with any of these elements here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, even if not all of them are used, or some of them are duplicated in here, it will work. So, let's look at the code once more. Change number one was to make these not constant, but public int and public float. Change number two. We add in a private field that can be serialized that will hold our card IDs. Change number three was to Remove this line of code, and instead of the array of numbers being hard-coded like that, we're gonna call the produce deck method and pass in the card IDs for deck, which is uh, defined all the way up here. Change number four was to add in a produce deck method that looks like this. Change number five is to add in a counter that'll tell us how many cards we've added in so far. Change number six is to add this code where if we exceed the number of if the number of cards added meets or exceeds the number of cards in our deck already then we cannot add any more cards in such in such a case then the for loop will basically skip that iteration Change number seven was to change this index value, so instead of j times grid columns plus i, it's just cards added. Change number eight, which is optional, a debug line for debugging purposes. And finally, change number nine, because we have this counter called cards added, at the end of the for loop, we need to increment it. So that's it. Those are the changes we need to make the whole game scalable to any arbitrary deck we want with any card sprites that we want. Alright, that's going to be it for this uh, bonus video. Hopefully that helped out. If you're watching this in any of my classes, uh, if you have any further questions, uh, definitely feel free to email me. And that's going to be it for this video. Alright, thank you.